and we have this performance by Richard de Graft Terrier and Adre Enam Ama. A child who knows how to wash their hands sits to dine with elders. Now, we won't forget our manners. To every man and woman here in their seats, their rights will do. So, let it flow. A city set on a hill can never be hidden. And so today we are here to uphold a city of our own, one we've all come to know as home. Here is an old central university, our beloved home. Here lies a great story of becoming. A journey of a thousand miles, they say, begins with a solitary step. And so today we are here to look back on all the 25 steps we've taken. We are here to hold account of every shade. It's black and white. A memory folded on a tank of praise. A story of all the lives you've carried on the way. There is more ahead. This is no mirage. There is growth in all the new steps you shall take from here. Central University, see you. A universal gradient propelling, training, transforming, and stationing leaders across the center of our modern world. A song beating along the dance of educating all and leaving none behind. Aiko. 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 Today, we applaud the Silver Jubilee. And in all honesty, there's more to jubilate as we celebrate and look at this institution as an eagle that has soared on the wings of time. Forward into time. Stay with time. But not to say you've been one directional. Because like the seasons, you have changed. A tree which was once a sapling, growing through and understanding the times, impacting our days and building our years. They say it's a silver one we have, but without a sliver, shred, nor an iota of doubt, you deserve that golden crown. You deserve that golden crown. Today we pull our thanks to talk about your remarkable growth. Today, we are here to show you how beautiful you've become and how beautiful you would look in some years to come. Today, we draw out our arsenals to hail you for your dedicated goal to make us leaders. Aiko. Aiko. In Miocho, where our eagle inspires. We've seen how every flight should look like. At a steady low ground and a quick shoot into the sky. And even that isn't the limit. No, not the limit. Some dreams were born here. Some died and were birthed anew. Like the phoenix, clad in ash and rising once more. You know not the fear of the ominous sound of death. We move, or so they say. But that is what you do, moving beyond the normal, equipping the youngins with more than butter to bake their daily bread. You give us timeless recipes, and for that, we are thankful. You understand our diversity. That has been my journey in this city. I, too, uphold this city with light. Only dreams are born here. It doesn't mean we must sleep always. It means that come, dwell, I prepared grounds for you. Rest and weave years worth of dreams and then go into labor. Push forth the hottest degree, the one that won't only burn you, but the one that will fuel your energy to become outstanding leaders in the society. You say this and even more. You tell us that mankind is the temple of God. And so even while we are far away from home, you have enough space in your Christ temple for us to dwell. Today we join hands. Be it mutual, Christ temple, Kumase, Osu. We take hold, we match with, with the, the moment. moment. We are home. We've seen the light. You are the city. We are here to uphold you. For your 25 years of outstanding growth. Central University, where these values are central to us. Faith. Central. Integrity. Central. Excellence. Central. Here's the next 25 years. See, See you at CU.
Thank you very much. Please, we can do it better than this. Thank you, the group Tavia and Enam Ama. At this stage, I'd like to call upon the, the chairman to introduce to us our speaker for this evening. Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman of Council, Madam Florence Hushful, please rise so that the House will see you. Thank you. Members of faculty, directors, deans, and all invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker for this evening. Even without a prepared script, there is a lot that I would love to say. And Dr. Ishmael Evans Yamsen, Honoris Causa, Chairman of MTN Ghana, Chairman of Gassam Ghana Limited, Chairman of Mantrak, Chairman of Ishmael Yamsen Associates, and there was a time in my life when he was chairman of everything. <laughs> Everywhere I pass, chairman. So in short, we have now called him chairman. He was once chair of the University of Ghana Council, president of the Ghana Employers Association, chairman of Standard Chartered Bank, Chairman of BOP, Chairman of TOP, Chairman of Unilever Ghana. It's an endless list. Reverend Professor Ebo Philip Bonzi Simpson, I have now noticed you are sitting right behind Chairman. So I must do due. Professor Ebo Bonzi Simpson, you're very welcome. Professor Simpson is the current newly minted Vice Chancellor of Methodist University. Many of us know him as the immediate past rector of GIMPA, but he has such energy he's into many other things. And um, he and I, we are old Vandals. So, Ishmael Evans Yamsen, our speaker for this evening, started his corporate career in 1966. I don't know how many of us were born at that time. <laughs> when he joined UAC Ghana, the predecessor to Unilever Ghana Limited, after graduating BS Economics from the University of Ghana. His training and development began with Accra Ice Company the first division of USC as a management trainee at a rigorous selection process, during which time the then young Ishmael Yamsen surprised the panel with a prediction that within 20 years he will be sat in the chairman's seat of USC. They laughed him off. Little did they know. Within two years or even less, within 14 months, he had been appointed as a full manager of the business. Dr. Yamsen was transferred to Kumasi Brewery Limited in 1972 as a Goulder Brands manager and got his first senior management appointment in 74 as a marketing director of Kumasi Brewery Limited. In Kumasi Brewery he introduced for the first time in Ghana the key distributor concept which made significant changes to wholesale and re retail business in Ghana. In 1978, Samson was transferred back to UAC Ghana, and this time the textiles division of, as general manager and a director of UAC, with responsibility for the textiles printing company GTP and Japan Textiles. It was during this, these days in textiles in 1982 that the Revolutionary Workers' Defense Councils of both GTP and JTP orchestrated a workers' takeover of the two factories. It took 11 years before the then BNDC 
return the factories to the control of the private sector, having run them down, it took another 27 million US dollars to bring the factories back. In 83, Ishmael Yamsen was transferred to UAC Tanzania to turn around the business with added responsibility for East Africa and Zambia. He recorded UAC, UAC Tanzania's first profit within nine months. In nine years, within seven months of joining the company. Tanzania was a company in distress. The model had been designed to promote graft and corruption. The executive management and directors were 100% Tanzanian Indians. The finances of the business were out of control. Leadership was rudderless. It was a management test that Ishmael Yamsen had to pass. The situation presented an opportunity for him to demonstrate his capacity to turn the business around. After ruthless confrontation with the graft and greed, which had driven the underperformance of the business for many years, a new business model was established. The finances of the business were restructured and brought under control with huge savings made. A new executive committee and a new board were established with a clear purpose for profitability. These changes were underpinned by a new people management model, which restored employee confidence and trust in the business and its executives and the board. The company won its first government tender of 120 million to import Caterpillar equipment for a new major road construction project. With a performance, Ishmael Yamsen was asked to return to Ghana in 1986 to take over the business of UAC Ghana in November 86 as his chairman. If those who had laughed him off 20 years ago knew, because it was exactly 20 years from when he made his prediction at that interview. Between 86 and 92, he set out conscious to restructure the business of UAC Ghana which then had over 21 divisions and companies, all of which were losing money. Out of the 21 companies, Shmayamson created six, closing businesses, merging some, and selling others. A major corporate restructuring exercise never known in Ghana's history. I must add that I got to know Mr. Yamson in my early initial days when I returned from the UK and was a faculty member at the then School of Administration. Later on, he introduced me to the Unilever business and has been a significant and encouraging part of my growth. There's hardly any part of my career growth that I have never made him know about. My wife who is sat behind Mr. Yamson's daughter, Sylvia, is also very close to Mr. Yamsen, and we have both benefited considerably from his impact, his help, his support, and the general encouragement he gives you. He is one who is deeply concerned about the growth of young people, virtually every single one. Uh, Sylvia, I want to preach. Virtually every single one of the young ones who worked with Mr. Yamsen, Dr. Yamsen, in those days, today, is a significant high flyer. We thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And today, we call upon you to speak to us on your chosen topic. So, sir, your audience, audience, your speaker. Thank you. So when Prof asked me to come and speak, I hesitated, and I said, what do I do? Now I'm going to talk to a university dons and students. And uh, how do I go and present myself as a, a younger, wiser man? So I decided that I would wear jeans and wear white shirts to look a little younger. Mr. Chairman, the subject of leadership 
has been key to me for a very long time. First of all, I will, I will do three things. I will look at the global and domestic changing trends, which have had profound impact on the economies of the world and our own domestic economy, and how leaders all over the globe have responded. Secondly, I will look at the leadership mindset and profile required in Ghana to respond to these developments and try and evaluate how our Ghanaian leaders have performed in the face of these leadership movements and tests. Finally, I will try and share some thoughts on the shifts in mindset and profile that our Ghanaian leadership would require if Ghana must succeed in building a prosperous country on a sustainable and resilient basis. As you can see from the topic, leadership for the future, reflections from a 50-year career in corporate Africa, this is not intended to be an academic thesis about leadership. I'm only here to share with you my leadership experiences as a corporate executive. Mr. Chairman, in 2019, the world was thrust into a catastrophe from the COVID-19 pandemic, a medical crisis which morphed quickly into a major economic and social crisis across the globe. Many countries and companies buckled. Others were able to adjust the demands of the new fractured world economic structures with supply chain disruptions, rising costs, rising inflation, and depreciating currencies. Following on the heels of the pandemic was Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which worsened the disruptions, the uncertainties, and the economic and social dislocations which followed the outbreak of COVID-19. Together, the economic catastrophe caused by these two major developments are still gathering momentum with no end in sight. But even before COVID-19 struck, the world was already going through a seismic technological transformation driven by rapid digitalization of processes and systems, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, nanotechnology, biotechnology, robotics, and humanoid robotics, and many other technological innovations now termed the fourth industrial revolution. With these technological changes have emerged new generations, namely the generation millennials, the generation Z, and now the artificial intelligence generation. All young people born after 1989, whose, whose expectations, skills, and behaviors are completely different from those which countries and businesses and people like me have been used to. Collectively, these developments are causing profound changes in the way the world economies and businesses are run, from global trade to global peace and security. The danger is that many countries and businesses see the underlying drivers of these changes as isolated occurrences. But I'm of the view that viewing them as isolated occurrences, they blur our view of the underlying transformational trend. It is not surprising, therefore, that in Ghana, the economic mess that we are in today is being explained away simply by the government as having been caused solely by the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. While there's no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have caused extreme disruptions to global economies, it is also clear that the failure of Ghanaian leadership to understand the major global trends which are dramatically changing the world and their associated risk 
have been a major cause of Ghana's economic crisis. And to this, we must add Ghana's own changing trends and governance weaknesses, which have long been ignored and which I now wish to address. When I first joined UAC of Ghana in 1966 as a management trainee, and until 1981, Ghana had six military regimes several attempted or rumors of coup d'etats and two civilian administrations, namely the Buzia and the Man administration. On the average, Ghana changed government every 22 and a half months, with the only regime which stayed in office long being that of Flight, Flight Lieutenant J.J. Rawlings, which lasted 11 years from 1981 to 1982 even if we discount, we discount the three-month AFRC reign of terror from June, June 4, 1979 to 24th September 1979. The 15-year period, also described as Ghana's lost years, was characterized by chaos, economic and social uncertainties, dislocations, economic malaise, economic mismanagement, breakdown of governance, and general economic deterioration. No regime, military or civilian, was able to put Ghana firmly on the path of sustained economic transformation to create a high-income, prosperous economy which moves on its own axis. Besides, governments during those 50 years were characterized by greed, graft, and corruption, destruction of the country's infrastructure from lack of investment and a complete failure of leadership to understand the changes that were taking place, especially the rapid globalization of world trade, which was propelling the transformation of the Asian Tigers at the time. Consequently, for 15 years, Ghana never succeeded in building strong institutions and governance structures to drive sustained economic transformation, growth, and widespread prosperity. And not only that, Ghana also systematically destroyed the governance values, core values of transparency, accountability, integrity, and reward systems based on performance and achievement. The rise of the Asian targets from first world to third world during the same 50-year period, contrast dramatically what had happened in Ghana. Apart from South Korea, none of those countries was, was led by a military messiah or a charismatic leader. Each one of those Asian targets was led by a leader with a clear mission and a clear purpose, which they also executed with passion and commitment as well as uncompromising and un unyielding adherence to good governance and respect for the rule of law. Yet there seems to be a common refrain, especially recently in Ghana, that what Ghana needs is a dictator and a strong man leader eh, or a one-party state to develop. That cannot be true. J.J. Rawlings ruled Ghana for almost two decades first as a military dictator, and they proclaimed Ghana's economic Messiah from 1979 to 1991, and continued for almost another decade from 1992 to 2000 as a civilian president, succeeding only in handing over a broken and bankrupt economy devastated by greed and corruption to the Kufour administration. It was no surprise, therefore, that Ghana had to be declared hippie, a happy, heavily indebted and poor country to secure debt forgiveness immediately after President Kufour took office. But even with massive debt relief, relief under the hippie program, the Kufour administration also succeeded in leaving a broken and bankrupt economy to Prophet Ivan Satamir's administration. After a successful IMF program, the Minister administration made some progress, but the succeeding administration also failed to build on the progress 
made by, made by the immediate past administration, while it was also accused of pervasive greed and corruption and economic mismanagement, causing it to massively lose the 2016 elections. The launch of the bold vision to create a Ghana without aid in April 2019 by the current regime, championed by its finance minister, was therefore, was therefore seen as a breakaway from our sordid past. Unfortunately, that too has now become a mirage and a mere slogan. Today, Ghana's economy is once again in tatters, the economic crisis deeper than ever before, with perceptions of greed and corruption more pervasive than in any other administration before it, and leaving Ghana still hugely dependent on aid, grant, and loans. The reason for Ghana's continued woeful economic performance and the pervasive poverty after the overthrow of the Kwame Nkrumah's administration should therefore be sought elsewhere. It is not definitely, it is definitely not due to the fact that we have not been led by a supreme dictator or a charismatic leader or that we don't have a one-party state. But the stark answer is that we have failed to identify, normalize, reward, and promote the right kind of leadership and commit to good governance practice. So permit me at this stage to summarize the reasons why Ghana needs new leadership for the future. I will then proceed to attempt to establish a new leadership mindset and profile required to build a new prosperous Ghana. I shall be brief. The many years of political instability and the associated breakdown of good governance, loss of key democratic principles, the disregard for the rule of law, and the destruction of our cultural values and behaviors, which had shaped our governance arrangements even at our traditional levels, accompanied by pervasive greed and corruption, have succeeded in accumulating very destructive values and behaviors, which have consistently undermined attempts to develop a prosperous country. And we are also now very conversant with the fact that our world has changed considerably driven by disruptive technological changes, fundamentally changing the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we teach and learn, the way medicine is practiced, even the way wars are fought, among many other changes in the lives of people all over the world. Regrettably, Ghanaian political, political dealers, leaders of the Dr. Kwame Nkrumah have failed to demonstrate any understanding of this complex external and domestic poly crisis with their disruptive changes and impact on the country and its citizens. And the simple reason is that we have not had and still do not have leaders who can anticipate the future, adapt and respond by changing the governance architecture and model and execute appropriate resilient plans to shore up the economy, grow it, and create jobs and wealth. Instead, they have always managed the past and today. Yet leadership is not about the past. It's about today and the future. The past only provides leaders with lessons of mistakes which should not be re repeated and the good things to build on. Ghanaian leaders post in Kroma have only focused on yesterday and today, and that is why we don't seem to be going forward, but rather going backwards. So what should Ghana's future leadership mindset and profile be? How should we select new fit for future leaders, and how can we identify, select, develop, and sustain them? Ordinarily, these questions should not be difficult to answer. In my corporate days at Unilever and other companies, leadership development was a major enabler of business performance and was taken seriously. 
It was designed to first identify the current and future needs of the business across board, define the right leadership profile that can respond to the needs of the business, identify potential candidates, agree specific training and development plans, as well as mentoring programs, and share with candidates their career paths together with annual evaluation schedule, usually based on potential performance, values, and behavior. It was a well-structured, transparent approach and had no room for nepotism, family and families, family and friends, favoritism, tribal relationship, all the things that have undermined the development of quality human resources for the public sector. Let me say up from that I'm very much aware that a business is not a country. However, I believe also that the principles of good human resource governance are the same for businesses and countries, even if the scope, the scale, and the application may differ. And also let me now attempt to apply my private sector experience to see how Ghana can respond to its current situation. I will attempt to list below what are considered the most critical short-term needs for which a new leadership is required in Ghana to address. And there are five of them. Ghana needs leadership with purpose, not leadership by slogans. Ghana needs restoration of macroeconomic, social, and social stability. We need a commitment to good governance. We need to eliminate greed and corruption. And we need to promote honesty and transparency in partnership with the private sector. In the short term, I consider these very critical. In the medium to long term, I see that Ghana needs to embed the culture of purposeful leadership, sustain macroeconomic stability over a minimum 10-year period, build a resilient economic model, invest in growth infrastructure, Lastly, and to me most critically, overhaul Ghana's democratic framework and build an inclusive society. One of the biggest causes of Ghana's current crisis has been the death of quality leadership. Leadership with purpose, leadership with integrity, leadership with honesty and conscience, driven by bold plans, not rather less leadership driven by greed and corruption. And as we all know, we have had too many of the latter. Undoubtedly, Mr. Chairman, leadership matters most in national development. We all know that a corrupt leader will always leave a bankrupt country for a personal gain. A rather less leader will resist change and miss all the opportunities that come with the change. An incompetent leader can only mismanage an economy to the detriment of the creation of wealth and jobs. And I can go on and on. It is for this reason that the issue elect of electing the right leaders has become key and urgent in Ghana. But unfortunately, what I see on the horizon does not give me confidence. We also not know that restoring macroeconomic stability in Ghana is urgent and critical. Our economy is traversing very difficult times. And reversing this situation is clearly urgent and requires a new leadership mindset. In Ghana's case, what is needed most is a small dose of humility. In Ghana's leadership, to admit that the country's crisis was homegrown and not imported, and that it is also more complex than just the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. And let me be clear, going to the IMF will never be a permanent panacea to Ghana's problems. Otherwise, we should not be where we are today, having been under farm programs 
16 times already. What will be a permanent solution is a commitment to a clear purpose to build a prosperous country for all and an uncompromising commitment to good governance, which I now wish to address properly. The, financials, the foundations of good governance have long been identified and extensively written about and discussed. They include probity and accountability by courtesy of Flat Left and J.J. Rawlings, transparency, integrity, honesty, credibility, predictability, and participation. But I don't want to belabor these, these points. I just want to point out that they are at the very core of good governance. What I need to add is that Ghana has consistently and sometimes even deliberately destroyed the institutions that have been established, some of which by the Constitution to enforce strict application of these governance principles. What I've seen in Ghana and most of Africa is rather a shift away from ensuring strong and functioning institutions to the concentration of power in the hands of heads of state and leaders, who some often lack the capacity, the integrity, and the willingness to pursue good governance. Today, in our country, power is concentrated in the presidency, and our allegiance is often owed not to the state and its citizens, but to the president and political parties. It is therefore not surprising that throughout our 66 years of political independence, during which, because of greed and corruption, the country has repeatedly been plunged into dire straits, there has only been a cosmetic attempt to punish public officials for wrongdoing. We need to return to our, our traditional core values of integrity and good behavior in public life. And we all know the adage, Zimba, yes, a good name is better than riches. When I was chairman of Stanchard, I arrived at the bank one day and I saw a huge pull-up banner with the inscription, Corruption Kills. In my office, I began to reflect on the banner. And it then dawned on me that the statement was pregnant with many truths. Every CD or dollar stolen from state coffers deprives a Ghanaian child somewhere of a life-saving vaccine, protective gear for medical practitioners, especially in this age of COVID-19, food for SHS students, clean water and motorable roads for rural communities, and safer highways and streets like to prevent accidents on our roads and in our cities, hospital beds for pregnant women, investment in the economy to create jobs for the teeming jobless youth, investment in science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics to build the foundations to enable Ghana to compete in the fourth revolution economy things we should ordinarily take for granted. But indeed, and indeed, it is corruption, and it is because of corruption that we consistently have bad governments in Ghana. We are still poor and highly indebted after six years of political independence, largely because of corruption. And we need to take some action to confront these destructive men without which we may become chronically distressed country. For many years, we have claimed in Ghana to be partnering the private sector in the pursuit of development. Yet all governments have continued to enlarge the public sector while the private sector growth and expansion have faced many obstacles. Given the tight fiscal space, it would only have been, it would have made sense 
If governments will turn to a private sector for investment in certain types of projects capable of offering commercial returns, such as renewable energy, port expansion, major roads and highways, railways, tertiary medical and educational facilities, among many such opportunities. The private sector has greater capacity to raise funds to invest in Ghana's economy than what governments can do, without further wasting the already stressed debt bed, and clearly relying on foreign direct investment and, a, and on a strong indigenous private sector working together is surely a better option for developing Ghana than raising debt for development. So now permit me to look briefly at what I see as Ghana's medium to long-term needs. And the very first one is that we should embed the culture of purposeful leadership. The Chairman, from my corporate experience, let me be emphatic. Leadership matters. It matters both in the delivery of long-term strategic development plans it is often at the core of success or failure. Leadership sets the tone for performance. It is responsible for the full application of all the governance principles of integrity, accountability, transparency, credibility, and humility. The leader sets the example of living the values, the behaviors, and the culture of the organization. And it's accountable for the delivery, the, the delivery of the purpose and objectives of the plan. It must be the same for countries, but sadly not Ghanaian leaders. Ghanaian leadership regrettably have been driven by short-term political cycle interests, have demonstrated sheer contempt for good governance. They have been greedy and corrupt, especially in this first republic, and we can see the impact, namely pervasive corruption, economic mismanagement, widespread poverty, unemployment, and a blatant disregard for the rule of law. Such leaders are clearly not fit for Ghana's future. Ghana requires from our future leaders clear purpose to confront these endemic, destructive habits and practices which have undermined our efforts to build a transformed and prosperous The second one I want to share some thoughts on is that we should sustain macroeconomic stability for the long term. Medium to long term stable macroeconomic environment is a, a prerequisite to attracting long term investment capital. Investment in manufacturing, agribusiness, tourism, technology, research and innovation all require long term capital and therefore require long-term macroeconomic stability, underpinned by stable political and social stability. But a stable macroeconomic environment alone is not sufficient. It should be underpinned by an efficient and competitive macroenvironment. This is common knowledge. Bad roads, poor social services, poor telecommunication network, poorly educated manpower, among many others, pose even greater threat to Ghana's attractiveness as a competitive investment destination. In 1990, the Ghana government and the World Bank issued a report, Ghana Towards a Dynamic Investment Response, which identified the reasons why the private sector had not responded to all the reform initiatives that Ghana had undertaken. The report enumerated a long list of investment constraints in both the micro and the micro environments which frustrated investment. I'm afraid all the constraints identified then in 1990, 23 of them persist today. So we should not be surprised that we have made no progress attracting strong private sector response apart from those into oil and gas and gold mining, natural resources that, that cannot be replenished. Ghana must not only ensure long-term stable macroeconomic environment over a minimum of 10-year period, but must also 
invest aggressively in competitive economic and social infrastructure to modernize the economy. That will be the only way to build long-term confidence in the private sector and investors to attract long-term capital. The chairman, the topic that is very demand on demand of businesses and countries is the one that says countries must build resilient economic models. At a recently ended Davos meeting of global political and corporate leaders, resilience was the subject that took center stage. Disrupt disruptions are not new, but the current era is increasingly defined by the interplay of complex disruptions with their disparate origins and long-term impl implications. So they require economic models which are not only robust and sustainable, but even more importantly, resilient enough to withstand the many disruptive changes the world is currently going through. Ghana has never been able to lay the foundations for a resilient economy. Any time commodity prices for the Ghanaian economy falls with them. The country has historically built no fiscal buffers, except during the Mahama administration, when some effort was made to create some buffers to shore up the economy in the event of a crisis, only for all those funds to be dissipated within a few years of this administration. Every corporate executive knows that liquidity is key to survival. Sadly, the reverse is true of Ghana. Virtually all our governments have been profligate in spending far more than our means and repeatedly resorted to debt financing, which often goes to finance consumption, not investment. When the debt becomes unsustainable, then run to the IMF. This cannot be a resilient development model going forward. But building a resilient economy should not be limited only to creating fiscal buffers. Ghana also needs re resilience in the supply of food and raw materials. And let me say, Ghana is more dependent on imported food supply than any African country. In the supply of workforce, which is skilled in modern science and technology, in the provision of social services, in the, main, in the maintenance of transparent legal and regulatory environment, and in ensuring sound fiscal system, among many critical areas. But let me stand one question note while on this subject of resilience. Ghanaian leaders must understand that the years of fossil fuel are numbered. And there's so much discussion going on on how throughout the world to stop the use of crude oil. We cannot continue to depend on revenue from crude oil to build a resilient economy in the future. So we must act now. Ghana has the natural resources to produce hydrogen. And we must begin to think big to replace crude oil with hydrogen for exports and local use to generate energy. And we need Ghanaian leaders who can anticipate the future and think big. As to investing in, in the growth infrastructure, I don't think anybody needs to educate Ghanaian government about the critical importance of investing in economic and social infrastructure as the foundation for economic transformation, development, and growth. What I must emphasize is that there is an urgent need to pay attention to investment in science, technology, innovation, mathematics, and engineering. The fourth industrial revolution of this century and the next requires that Ghana builds a workforce with skills and capabilities in digitization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, and many more. They are changing everything, and they are driving everything, and we fail to invest in them The chairman, one of the things that 
for Ghana's future, I believe we should pay very great attention is our democratic framework. I believe that in the long term, we must seek to overhaul Ghana's democratic freedom framework and build an inclusive society. Our democracy is at risk, undermined by three very dangerous interlocking factors. One, the inability of the electoral process to deliver the right political leaders. Two, the overconcentration of power in the executive. And three, the costly but ineffective governance arrangements provided by the Constitution. I intend to focus only on the first one for the sake of time, because it is more relevant to our topic and poses the greatest danger to Ghana's democracy. I have taken some time to read, with considerable trepidation, a recent publication by the Ghana Center for Democratic Development on understanding how dirty money funds campaign financing in Ghana an exploratory study. Indeed, it is dirty money that now controls the selection and election of Ghana's leaders from the world constituency and regional levels to the national level. Only candidates described in their report as biggest spenders get elected to become local executives, parliamentarians, presidential candidates. The financing for political campaigns with dirty money and the monetization of Ghana's democratic process clearly undermine the possibility of Ghana ever getting the right leaders for the future. They put at risk any possibility of a purposeful transformation of our economy and the building of a robust, resilient, and prosperous economy for future generations, while they also destroy any hope of a return to gov good governance in the public sector. Today, our democracy is no longer government of the people, by the people, for the people. It is now government to serve the interests of wealthy individuals and special interest groups and corporates. And of course, aided by poor and vulnerable delegates who are quick to sell their votes for peanuts. And they sell their votes with the mistaken belief that they are reaping up front their share of the benefits of the democratic process. When indeed all they, are, they will achieve is the total surrender of their right to demand accountability from their elected officers, while mortgaging Ghana's future to charlatans, to cabals, and sometimes to people involved in illegal and illicit businesses. My view going forward is that we should revisit the constitutional review undertaken during the Mills administration, update it, given what we now know and see, and make this constitution relevant to our current needs and promote good governance. And there are three specific areas of interest to me. The first is to review the section 70 of the, of the Constitution, reconcile section 35.7 and 36.5 of the Constitution to promote shared purpose to focus on development and avoid waste, and review section 47 clauses 1 and 5 to contain costs and build greater efficiencies. Additionally, every effort must be made to strengthen the provisions dealing with the funding of political parties and campaign funding, funding, financing in the Political Parties Act 2000, Act 574, to respond to what clearly are red signs to the stability of our democracy. Can we see the clips? ineffective, ignorant politicians consistently spend more money than they can raise. 
and then they borrow, and they borrow, and worse, they then print money because politicians and their central banks have a machine which prints money. You do that as a private citizen and it's a criminal offence. You would go to prison for doing that and politicians and their central banks do it all the time. Let me explain to you that these countries are broke and they're broke because of their own stupid leadership and politicians and it's immoral, immoral to ask ordinary taxpayers of any country to pick up the tab for failed politicians and failed banks. They are defaulted, they're broke, for God's sake, let's all of us admit it. Singapore has gone from being a third world country to a first world country. I'm going to share with you the secret of Singapore's success free of charge. If you implement this secret formula, your country will succeed. And I capture the secret formula with the acronym in English, uh, MPH. The M stands for meritocracy. Uh, meritocracy means that you select the best people to run the country. And what brings many countries down, uh, especially in the third world, is that when it comes to selecting the finance minister or the oh, economics the minister, minister, they will give their job to their brothers, their cousins, their uncles, their relatives, they're not the best people. The second, the second pillar, pillar is, uh, is uh, P, P, and P stands, stands for pragmatism. pragmatism. But the best, the best definition, definition of pragmatism, pragmatism is given by Chinese, Chinese leaders. leaders. It doesn't matter whether a cat is black or a cat is white. If the cat catches mice, it is a good cat. So the same way, it doesn't matter what your ideology is. If it works, you're not bound by any ideology. But the third pillar, the H is of course the hardest to achieve. Because H stands for honesty. And indeed, what has brought most of the countries down has been corruption. And so, Mr. Lee, when you are here, you can find this. Made it a point, made it a point to punish, punish not the real people, 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 but the very senior people. That's, that's the, formula the formula of Singapore, of Singapore success. success. You know, we, we're living in a political bubble where, where we blame, blame politicians, politicians for being corrupt. But politicians, politicians are corrupt because, because of the people, people that, that we lead. Because the because Ghanaian, Ghanaian people, people are innately corrupt. corrupt. The average Ghanaian is extremely corrupt. And has absolutely lost their moral fiber. And politicians are a reflection, by microcosm of the larger community, by a reflection of the community and the people that we lead. So if you are, for example, a party executive who's sworn an oath to do party work, and part of your party work is to elect a leader for your party in your constituency, but you are deciding to give a bill to a person who is competent to pay before you would elect them, he would have to find the money. He doesn't have the money, so he'll go to business interest and go and take the money from a businessman and come and pay. To get elected but when he gets elected and he's put in an executive position as a minister or a deputy minister and has to award a contract don't forget that the business interest to give him the money is not for the christmas even santa claus you have to perform be a good boy before he'll give you a gift so you do something before you get it so that person gave you money for a reason he's going to come back and come and take it in an inflated contract and then you turn around and say that that minister is corrupt why why is he corrupt he's not corrupt He's only paying for the money he advanced to you. It's a loan he gave to you. He's paying it back using your taxes. So the problem of our country is the fact that every facet of our life is saddled with corruption, even okay. outside of politics. Because ah, your DJs, I'm not saying multimedia, but DJs across the board. Somebody is an up-and-coming artist. Okay. That song, play payola. If you don't play payola, they won't play your song. You go to a hospital. You have to go and t get your file. The person is sick and dying. Give the person his file. Unless you put 5 CD or 10 CD in the thing, your file will not come out. You go to a parking lot. You want to park. Security man who is paid so, to do his job. So unless Sam, you give him 2 CDs, you won't get a place to park. Sam, Imagine that person is now a minister. So, did you have to do that to also uh, get elected? Are you asking me if I've ever paid money to people when I'm going to get elected? In fact, obviously, that's what you're trying to say. I mean, Nanka. You're, you're justifying it. N no, Nanka, <laughs> how did you think I, you think I didn't, you think I was sitting here and tell you I didn't pay? I paid. They paid more than me, but I paid. I paid less than them, but still I won. How much did you pay? When they, be uh, brave, different. There are those who get 100 CDs, those who get 200 CDs, those who get 500 CDs. It's level by level. Monkeys play by sizes. <laughs> I wouldn't lie about it. I see. Because, at, because, at, at because a time, it's the reality. Okay. And in government and in public service. So why, so do, you why do you want to be president? Well, well I want, I to, want be to be president 
uh, because I want to be the flag bearer of the MPP, which is what is driving me, to give an opportunity for me to make a, a contribution to the new patriotic party, as you saw in 2020. Who are going in there not to go and fill themselves? In fact, because that is what everybody believes now. You know, because they've seen a few bad examples. Young people who finish university have never worked before, trust into big positions, and within a few years they are showing of off Ghanaians, cars and having right, lush weddings and all kinds of stuff. Spirited when you are a public in our country, and when who you are, are going in there not to, have to go be and sensitive fill themselves? To the because that is what it's everybody not everything believes. Everything that is even showcased. You know, and because now, I've seen a few bad examples. Worsened by the young social media. Finish university, the kinds never of things that I see. Fast into big Some of my colleagues within a few years put on the social media. Cars and I'm having lush I'm weddings and all kinds Once of you're stuff. In when authority. you are public, sensitive set, to the plight of the when you're politician, especially now when there's true suffering. We all know the whole it's not world. Everything that is even showcased in the last three years. It's been worsened by the social media. As Ghanaians, that is the kinds of things that I see. Sensitivity. So we don't talk about leadership. Put enough on the social media. The character of the leaders that we need. Once you know, it's not about money. It's not about throwing money or sharing rice or sharing sugar. Especially now, you know. So um, I think it's disrespectful, mm. you know, to the Ghanaian people when people engage in that. And I'm going to stand by what I believe. Sensitivity. So we don't talk about leadership doing things right. The character of the leaders that we need. You know, it's not about money. It's not about throwing money or sharing rice or sharing sugar. You know, so. Um, I think it's disrespectful. I can mm. actually to stop Ghanaian people when people engage in that. Because you and I'm going to stand by what I believe in. Uh, what is, believing what is propriety, in for you? doing things right. In the future, and you can compare why we are not making progress in Ghana and why Singapore is where it is today. So, just permit me to. Uh, share my thoughts on what Ghana future leadership mindset and profile should be. I, read, I mean, I've got some answers here. First, given my, my own experience, I believe that leaders are not born. Leaders learn to lead. And there's enough scientific evidence to support. So leadership is not a matter of inheritance, neither a matter of lineage. Leaders are and they must be developed. Second, leaders are not necessarily the most intelligent, the most ambitious, the most eloquent, the most vociferous, not the most charismatic, and not those with deepest pockets. This may help, but they do not define good leadership. That is why in the profit sector we have very copious leadership development processes. My knowledge of the British and European political system, as well as Malaysia and Singapore, and you heard the gentleman speaker of Singapore, is that political parties do have clearly defined the development leadership development program. And we can do the same. To build a country, a great country, in the medium to long term, I see that Ghanaian leaders must make six fundamental mindset shifts. They should stop being, or let me say, they should move from being heads of state to being leaders with purpose. Leaders who come to build. They should stop being mere leaders to becoming catalysts, change agents, motivating and empowering the whole country. They should move from being simply planners. And you can, if, if, if you have time, try and find out how many medium-term plans we have. They should now become architects. They should reimagine the future. They should innovate. They should design to build new economic and social architectures. They should move away from being controllers to being coaches. They should stop being bosses to being human beings, authentic servants of the people. 
being people-centered and pursuing inclusivity. But most importantly, they should move away from being greedy and corrupt to becoming honest and socially responsible leaders. These shifts will take some time, I know. But I, I believe that if there is a political will, they can, and we must make the effort to make those shifts. In the middle and long term, I, am, I believe that we must make a determined effort to achieve these shifts. And I recommend that our political parties must define very clear framework to define every political party must define the profile of their own fit for future leaders given their own political beliefs. They should recruit, train, monitor, and review their progress and expose them to international best practices. Ghana needs leaders who build, not leaders who destroy. Leaders who are rooted in today and tomorrow, not leaders who are rooted in yesterday and the distant past. According to Theodore Levitt of Harvard Business School, leadership is about tomorrow, not yesterday. But you see, most leaders manage for yesterday's conditions because yesterday is where they got their experiences and their successes. Above all, Ghana needs leaders who are incorruptible, who are honest, who are transparent, who are credible, leaders with integrity, conscience, and humility, leaders who build an inclusive society. Standing in Ghana's way, I'm afraid, is the monetization of the selection, election, appointment, and vetting of leaders from the world level the level of the executive and the legislator. And you heard it in the, in the clip yourself. Our process is woefully compromised. But Ghana can learn from the advanced countries as well as from South Asia, including Malaysia and Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, and recently Vietnam. Both Mahathir, Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister of Malaysia, Malaysia, and Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore annually sent minimum 500 carefully selected high potential future leaders to top universities all over the world to study and acquire skills and capabilities for leadership positions back in their countries. On a visit to Malaysia in 2002 with President Kufo, President Mahathir told the Ghana delegation that he knew that about 50% never return immediately to Malaysia. But he saw it as good investment in Malaysia's future governance. So the template for the, for the youth development is possible and available elsewhere in the world. And the Ghanaian political parties can borrow from it and stop, and stop putting into key leadership positions mediocre people who get to senior positions and only succeed country. Ghana has had a similar arrangement for a long time through the scholarship secretariat set up during the requirement of administration to do what the Singaporeans and Malaysians do. Sadly, the award of scholarship has also been politicized and scholarships are now awarded to family members, friends, and party supporters. And not only that, but even worse, the people who sometimes are not even the chairman, I know I have spoken for a long time, but it's only because the issue of poor leadership in Ghana has been the major cause of our dire economic circumstances and the pervasive poverty of our people. It is unacceptable, and we must reverse our preference for mediocrity for the sake of party, family, and personal relations, and embrace merit and capacity as the only means to get into this has been too costly to Ghana, and we must reverse it. There will be no future for Ghana and no hope for 
are you if we continue the same track of putting selfish and parochial interests above national interests? And let me repeat to close. Democracy is not only about the majority. It is even more so about values. The time is now or never. I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Question time. The first three question. Where do we start from? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, first of all, let me ask a question. Rwanda is an African country. The laws are obeyed. They have the only smart city in Africa. The, city, the cities are Parking clean. In fact, a few years back, businessmen and politicians from Ghana flew to Rwanda to go and see how the, what a miracle has been performed there. And I, when I heard the news, I was I was surprised, but I was also very disappointed. Here we are. Over 60 years of independence, we have had no wars. We have had only one crisis in 81, 82, 83, when we had a famine, and the whole world came to our rescue. And yet, 66 years, we are still promising better life in the future. The the artists who came here were saying they will see us 25 years from now. I don't know where you and I will be in 25 years. And what kind of country we will have 25 years from now if we carry on like this. First of all, when we start is, is with the leadership. You see, we, we say fish, the fish rose from the head. And I will tell you, the difference can be made only by leaders. Nobody else. If we have a president who today says, I will not be corrupt. I won't tolerate corruption. And is prepared to jail every leader. Did you hear from the Singaporean miracle? He says, look why you didn't jail the small people. He jailed the most senior people. So if I have jailed the, the minister, how can a deputy minister or chief director or whatever go and see? You know you will be jailed. And if a leader says the tone today, that will be where we start. So long as we have leaders who will compromise themselves and allow themselves to be compromised, I, unfortunately, I can't see us going anywhere. I can't. Because the man is telling you, I paid. I paid to go to Parliament. And when I go there, what do you expect from me? He's asking you. When I'm there, what do you expect me to do? Should I have money to go and pay my debt? So already, our system is, I mean, we have monetized the whole but it is because you wait and see the presidential campaign that will come next year. And ask yourself, where did this all money come from? So if the person who is going to be president is allowing himself to be compromised, then why do you expect him to behave differently when he is in the office? I'm saying the change will only come when you and I decide that we will not just vote because I am NPP, NDC, PPP, CPP, or whatever. But we will vote because we are convinced. And we can actually test that that man can make a difference. I know we can be deceived because we have been deceived before. We have. Did we hear 
that if you are, it's about money, don't join my party. So, we need a different kind of leadership. That is why it is so important. I had a conversation about a ward chairman. And this was on social media. We said, oh, media, I'm just waiting. If you decide to run, you come and we negotiate. If you pay, I can pay it for you. And they all know that I have many followers. But if you don't pay, I won't campaign for you. So we have all come to understand that political office must be sold and bought. So the rot starts from there. So the problem is if even you, if, how many of you, I mean, you have a university, so I'm, it is a university. So I'm sure you know the kind of university politics you have. Everywhere there's SIC elections, the politicians are there. If I'm lying, say so. So it starts from the university. And I'm sure even at the SHS, they will start going there. I remember there was one person, there was a politician who went to campaign at an SHS and caused a lot of problems. So they even want now to go to the level of the SHS and start polluting the children. And we are all looking on, you know, hoping that maybe a miracle will happen one day. It's in our own hands. That's all I'm going to say, because I think we'll have an opportunity to vote maybe 18 months or so, or so from now. And we have to make informed decisions. And we must help others. Because we just can't go on like this forever. The second question I didn't get very much is about laws, right? And, and the institutions. Am I right? Okay. I mean, recently there has been interesting conversation about um, S. Gracia. Now, I have had an opportunity to chair a committee to make recommendations to the president on the Article 71 officers emolument. And I was very emphatic. Scrap it. I received insults upon insults upon insults. But I, was, I didn't care. Because I asked myself a question. Who in the world is pensioned every four years and paid as gracia whether or not he delivers good performance or not. So for this excellent performance we have all seen, we are now going to pay as gracia. So yes, the law is there. Now we have to make sure that it is scrapped. And if, I, if you watch British and American meetings of representatives. Americans call it the, uh, the Congress. Uh, British people call it Parliament. You listen to the debate. Everything is about the people of the UK or the people of America. It gather, the party will decide and instruct how do you vote. So it's no longer, so that man was very right that he's going to go there just because of NPP. So our whole mindset is about party and not about nation. No, most of us don't go, if you have visited polling uh, booths and you have seen the Fracas. It's not about people exercising their right, but it's whether or not that person is voting for this party or that party. We've we've taken away our our commitment to our country, our nation, our generation, our people. 
You know, don't forget that the decisions the politicians are taking today will affect generations unborn. Those children are not part of the generations, the decisions we are taking. In fact, they are not even part, with all due respect, of our recklessness. But they will come and suffer because of what we did. Ghana has so many laws. But there's no, we, we claim this Ghana a country of laws. I don't believe that we are a country of no laws. We become a lawless country. You walk, at, drive around, every corner, somebody, once there is space, somebody will, will do business there. If you allow them, they will come to your compound and make this place a market. And nobody would protect you. And yet we have laws about property rights and all the rest of it. So I'm afraid we have the laws, we have the institutions. I'm actually being worried more about the institutions. Because our politicians have made sure that our, politi our institutions don't work. Because if the institutions work, then the laws will apply. But the institutions don't work any longer. Otherwise, why? Today, how, how much inflation are we facing today? We are, every day we wake up, yesterday, the Monetary Policy Committee raised the base rate, right? And I asked the question, but who has been printing the money? Because you print the money, and when you print money, it's inflationary. Then when you have caused the inflation, you say, I must raise interest rate to bring down the inflation. And I, I would have thought that we, the, the professors uh, in our university would stand up and say, enough is enough. But I'm not sure whether uh, we, we, we have mastered enough courage to, to confront that. The third question was about, what was the third question about? Universities. Oh, what, what about the Christian? Exactly. Versus, uh, I am going. happy that we are in a Christian compound. So I should probably ask the VC first. But the VC is not a minister. There's a pastor here. The thing is that I, unfortunately, in, in many years ago, the religious bodies were very vocal about bad governance. It does it seems to me that these days, the other are divided, or they have forgotten exactly what the Bible says about some of these wrong things. We, we, are we not here in Ghana when one of our very illustrious archbishops said we should pray for the city? I mean, how do you pray for the city? I know God listens a lot, and I am a believer, but I don't think that God will work to watch on why we print money and the city loses value and the God will come and say, I command the city to appreciate. I don't know whether it's in the Bible. I mean, are there any pastors here? So, our religious, I don't know what they can do. They have, I hear they have made statements, they have prayed, they have uh, fasted, and some of them, I understand, you know, they, they set up camp to pray for a return of Ghana to sanity. I'm afraid, as he said, the pastors are also part of our community. And maybe we have infected them with our sinfulness. 
So they have lost some powers. We go to church. I go to church every Sunday, but I know that going to church doesn't make me a Christian. I must live by Christian values. That is what will make me a Christian. So all those religious bodies, if they are truly living, they are living they are Christian or Muslim values. They must speak up. They must speak up. But don't leave them out. Also include the traditional rulers. I, I pity them. The, Mr. Soso so is coming. They don they are heavy and I work and it's heavy. And in this sun, you are sweating. And the man will not even come on time. So you go there, they say he's coming at 9 a.m. At 3 p.m. he hasn't been arrived. They haven't given you water. They haven't given you food. You are still waiting for him. Because what? Because he's Mr. So -so -so. He is maybe president. So you have to sit downwards in the sun to wait for him because leadership is discipline. If you say, I'll be there at 9 a.m., you should be there at 9 a.m. So it's not only about religious leaders. Our traditional leaders are part of the problem. I remember in the last election, one of them said, if this man doesn't win, I will destroy myself. When the man lost, he said no. So, and these are the people who are the custodians of our values and behaviors and our culture. And the Constitution was very clear in making sure that they are isolated. But they say, no, we want to be in the middle of it. Again, because of money. So I'm, I am afraid, and I'm sorry to be painting a very bleak picture, but it is a reality. And there, it is a reality, and it is because all of us, wherever we are, if we really don't like what we are seeing, we must speak up, and we must do something about it. And we must make sure that it doesn't matter. Donald Trump is facing court action. Past presidents have been jailed, prime minister has been jailed in, in, uh, in uh, uh, where is uh, Malaysia, recently. So why our presidents and ministers, why do we worship them as if they are gods? They are human beings like ourselves. We voted for them. We paid them. We have to call them to account for their stewardship. But, you know, I'm sure by now I'm being insulted on social media. I'll stop here. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we all appreciate the fact that Dr. Yamsen has been on his feet for so long, and at this stage, we we'll draw the curtain on the Q&A session. I have a few announcements to make before I call the, the chairman to give his closing remarks, but ladies and gentlemen, let's give Dr. Yamsen another big hand of applause. Thank you. Chairman. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Let's make a take your seat. We can do it better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A few announcements, and then the chairman will come in to give his closing remarks. On the 26th of April at Mutual, we're going to have a program that we call Poetry Under the Eagle. So you join us at Mutual for this very interesting uh, program. I know my vice chancellor will feature prominently. We also will launch our CU Care. CU Care will be launched on 5th of April. And when it's all over, please don't rush away. There will be some small refreshment here. 
At this stage, I call upon the Vice Chancellor, Professor Bill Pupulampo, who is also the chairman of the evening's program, to come over and give his closing remarks. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pro Vice Chancellor. Once again, a great thank you to Dr. Ishmael Yamsen for a very lively lecture, which touched on very, very important matters. Thank you very much, sir. Really, I am not one to try and summarize these lectures because there's no point. We've heard Dr. Yamsen himself speak. The key thing that I'd like to take away is the fact that leadership is leadership and leadership matters. And the corporate examples that he gave and the corporate values that he pointed, accountability, humility, recognition of what matters, they are the same. And they apply to the national case. Thank you for all the questions. I just pray that somehow, in our own individual ways, as Dr. Yamsen said, it starts from our hearts. As individuals, in our own little ways, we do have to commit to a different approach to leadership so that when the opportunity brings itself, we shall not be found wanting. Dr. Yamsen, thank you very much. We do trust that should we call you again, you will willingly come. And next time we call you, we'll actually take you to Mewtwo. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. All too soon, we've come to the end of the program. We started with a prayer, and I would like to call upon Mrs. Eliza Totime to give us the closing prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this evening's lecture and all that we have learned. We pray for grace, Lord, to go out there and be instruments of change. We pray, the Bible says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. We pray for a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And we pray that, Father God, great transformational leaders, Father God, are going to come out of this place after this lecture. And our nation, Father, will be transformed to your glory. Thank you that you are starting with us. And we are going out there to be a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. It's, um, one announcement that almost escaped me, that is our upcoming lecture. And the topic will be the new paradigm for public sector compensation every statement. And this will be given by Professor Philip Ebo Bonzi Simpson, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, sorry, sorry, the Vice Chancellor for Methodist University. The date will be announced later. So please we expect you to show up again. Thank you so much and have a good night. <laughs>